Shalom friends. Today we're filming from Tel Sheva, which most archaeologists believe this is ancient Be'er Sheva. Our location is in the desert area of the Negev. A desert is defined by its lack of water, less than 200 milliliters of rain a year. So uh, living here would be a challenge. To the north of where we are, uh, starts the Judean mountains where we would find Hebron and further on Bethlehem and Jerusalem. To the east from here we'll head to the Judean wilderness and eventually to the Dead Sea, the lowest point on earth. To the south we would head to the deeper Negev area, the lower part, and eventually the Red Sea. And beyond the Tel here, way to the west, that's already the shoreline of the Mediterranean Sea. Beersheba was settled by people throughout history. Throughout history meaning we have archaeology here from more than 4,000 years ago. And that was due because of the possibility of getting water. Again, a desert area lacks water. But Beersheba is located just below the Judean mountains. The Judean mountains, as well as Samaria, northern to it, is limestone. When it rains, the water seeps through the rock and flows until it exits or keeps inside the rock as groundwater. You just have to know where to dig to get to the water. The thing is, although here we see sand all over, below the sand there's the continuing of the uh, limestone coming from the Judean mountains underneath the sand. Uh, on both sides of this tell, this artificial mount of Tel Sheva, we have rivers. We have the Beersheba River underground and we have the Hebron one. So you don't have to dig too deep into the ground around here to reach the groundwater, making it possible to live here. And that's exactly what people did for thousands and thousands of years. Beersheba is mentioned in our scriptures many times. Uh, it has to do a lot with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we read that at times Abraham is on the mountain in Elon Mimra, in Hebron, and at times here in Beersheba. Why is that? Well, Abraham, as well as the nomadic people, uh, or the shepherds, moved from one point to another. In the summertime, it would be much better to live and move your flock of sheep and goats and the people to the higher grounds, to the mountains, where it was not as hot as it is here in the desert area. Maybe even more possibility for water. And in the winter time, when you have flows of water, mostly floods coming from the mountains, or more groundwater, they would come here and stay around here. That's why in scripture sometimes he's there, sometimes they're over here. But saying that they came here to Beersheba, that means the area of Beersheba. True. Behind me is a city surrounded by its walls. We're going to talk about that uh, very shortly. But most of the people did not stay inside. Most of the people lived around, mostly beside the, the two river areas that are dry, but they do have ground water underneath them. By the way, you would dig your well, you would uh, uh, take your chance on the spot of your dig. If you hit water, that's it, you're saved, you and your family. But if try after try again, you don't find water, this could be the end. For you and your family. So it was crucial. That's why in scriptures also we read about the many uh, wars that took place around here about the wells. People tried to take wells off uh, other people. You had to protect it with your life. So today scholars believe that the city itself was settled by uh, maybe military, maybe administrative or royal uh, high status people from this area, and the, the common people, the nomadic people, the shepherds, were around the city. 
And today we have a view of the, the Bedouins, the nomadic people of our times, uh, living right uh, um, in the dry river area of the Vadi. Uh, maybe we could get an idea of how it used to be in ancient times. Maybe this was not uh, an area where uh, common people would settle. Maybe it was a junction point where the nomadic people and the shepherds met and stayed outside the city. Nevertheless, Beersheba uh, is mentioned in scriptures and we read about uh, Abraham coming here in Genesis 21 verse 14. Uh, there's the story of uh, Sarah feeling bad because of Abraham having Hagar and his son Ishmael from her. And the Lord talks to Abraham and tells Abraham, you have to let Hagar and Ishmael go. And from this area around us, Hagar and Ishmael were sent into the desert area. Here, as it's written in Genesis 21 verse 27 to 32, Abraham built the covenant with uh, Abimelech. He brought seven sheep here. And then he gave the oath to put an end to the argument of the wells. And because of that, the name of this place would be called Be'er Sheva. Be'er in Hebrew means well. There's a well here, but I doubt that this is the well. It had to be uh, by the dry river areas. And Sheva means also seven, seven sheep. But we think the meaning comes from the oath, Shvua. They gave an oath to one another for peace, the end of the argument. The well, well, they gave their oath. And later on, in Genesis 21, verse 33, it says that Abraham planted a tabernacle tree somewhere around here. Already in the time of King David, Beersheba was built as a, as a very good administrative city, a center of this area where uh, people of higher status, as we said, from around this area settled in. But it would be a few hundred years after that, around the 8th century BC, that Beersheba uh, became great. It wasn't a big city, but it was a very important one. It would be the center of the desert. Uh, the royalty of this area, it's administrative, would come and settle inside about 400 people. It would be rich. It would control the, uh, the roads leading up to the mountains. Maybe at times the people that wanted to pass through here would have to pay taxes to pass through here. There would be a big wall surrounding Beersheba, something like 400 meters, 1,200 feet. It would be fortified very, very well. The wall would be a double wall with uh, uh, rooms in between it, maybe for the soldiers, maybe where people dwelled beside the wall. There is something here outside the gate that is not unusual. Here we find a well, a well that is around 69 meters deep until it reaches the limestone level and could uh, reach the water inside the rock which is uh, close to 200 feet more or less deep. It's beside the gate because you would have convoys coming through here, you would have strangers, you would have nomadic people passing through here. You don't want them to enter into your city. You do want to give them water. There would be another water system deeper inside. You don't want them to pass inside your city. So you would have this well outside of the city gate for them to take a drink and fill up uh, their containers. We read about these wells outside the gate in scriptures in Genesis 24 verse 10. When the servant of Abraham 
uh, was sent to find a wife for Isaac, yeah, Rebecca, and he met her outside of the gate by the well. Jacob met Rachel outside of the city by the well. And in 2 Samuel 23, verse 15, uh, when uh, David was with uh, the Philistines after he hid in the, uh, in the cave of Adullam, he said, will somebody please give me a drink? He was thirsty from the water of the well that is outside of the walls of Bethlehem. Yeah, that's a well-known story. So this was very, very common in ancient times. This is something that we see here as well. The gate was a very important area of the city. Here is where people would connect. Here is where people would meet, close deals. At times you would even have markets outside of the gate, again, so people would not have to enter into your city. They could do their shopping outside. At times, you would have high places, altars outside of the city. I mean, if you're uh, journeying around here and you want to pray for safety, you want to give an offering to your God, you could do it outside the gate. At times, the kings would sit by the gate to welcome the people, or judges and policemen to give them a fair trial. This gate had uh, niches as you would enter on both sides, 3-3. Three, three. And this is for the people to enter, but you also want to secure the city. So you would have policemen there, army, to check the people out. Maybe a place for the judges, for the king. It would be quite a big gate. You could see that the walls around here are made, first of all, the lower level from stone, but above it from mud. We have stone around here, but mostly sand and mud. This was one of the ways that they built in the desert area. You put mud above the stone and you cover it with plaster so the mud would not dissolve. But the lower level would be stone. So when it rained, the foundations would not dissolve. Now a lot of this, uh, uh, the walls around here, and especially this gate, is reconstructed redone just for your better understanding. We could see the restoration line, the line in front of you, showing you uh, below what was found when archaeologists came and dug, and above it, what was redone for our better understanding. Let's go in. So here, we're at the courtyard, the entrance square. In the pagan world, it was known as the Agora, the square, one of the main areas of the city. Here, people would gather, would also close the door, just like in the uh, gate area, one of the two main areas of the city. Here, the king at times, or the leader, would come and address the people. We read about it so many times. Here, we could see exactly how it used to be. Every road eventually connects to the entrance square, to the city center. From here we could go to the storage rooms. From here we could go to uh, the governor's palace. We could go to where the, we believe the altar stood. From this main point, this main junction, we could head all over the city. So as we would enter the city, we would come upon the three first structures around here. Long structures, big structures, with two sets of columns in each uh, room. And these were in fact the storage rooms that King Hezekiah ordered to build here in Beersheba. Now you see, convoys pass through here, 
uh, trade passes through here. It won't be too difficult to fill up these storage rooms. And also people had to give tithes for the king and for the people, for the less fortunate. And it would be wine, it would be olive oil, grains that would fill up these storage rooms for a time of need. For the king to give the orders to the convoys or to the army when it was needed. We could actually read about it in scriptures in 2 Chronicles 32 verse 27 concerning King Hezekiah and the storage room. As we entered to the city square, we took a left to the south and we could find here a room, a structure that had stairs leading up. And this part is missing. What we believe existed here would be the altar, the four horn altar that was found and today is placed in the Israeli museum, probably an altar of paganism. Uh, a replica lies around here, but uh, you could understand how they uh, used to give offerings around here, up the stairs and to the altar. With all the stories that took place here, it's uh, quite uh, uh, unusual how Beersheba did not become one of the holy cities for the Jews throughout history. You know of four cities, Beersheba is not one of them. And probably it's because of what went on inside. We understood that this place was the place where people were worshipped for pagan gods most of the time. And the prophet Amos, he rebuked the people telling him, you have to leave Beersheba, you have to leave this idea of paganism. And so they did. And perhaps that's the reason or one of the reasons why Beersheba is not looked upon as a holy city or a holy site in Judaism throughout history. So now we're at the southern side of the city in the tell itself and we could find here ruins of houses where people dwell, the four room houses that were known back then in time. Actually uh, in a lot of biblical uh, sites around Israel we find the four room houses. The houses would be divided by columns. Each room had its own purpose. One room for storage, the other room for animals, the other room for day-to-day -day work and where people dwell. As you could see, the inner room, deeper inside, is attached to the wall. And if we say that this is a, a casement wall, a uh, double wall, so uh, the inner part between the two walls was used as a room for the people. And it reminds me of a story from Joshua 21, verse 15, when Rahab helped the tribes of Israel, helped the two spies that entered Jericho, and it said that she lived by the wall. So this is exactly how it would look like, made out of stone, not uh, uh, mud blocks, but like this. The rooftop would be very, very important because in the summertime it gets so, so hot. So they had to have stairs leading to the rooftop where people would sleep at nighttime, would refresh. And the Bible gives us uh, uh, instructions how to build these houses and also how to put railings on the rooftops so one would not fall or have any misfortune there. Scripture thought about everything. The Lord thought about everything. Let's continue.
So now we reach the uh, bigger water system inside the city at the northwestern point of it. You see, they needed another water system for a time of siege, for a time of danger, that was underground. We could just see the top part of it, but it goes deep down. Deep down, we have big pools that are covered with plaster, big pools of cisterns that would capture and hold uh, the flood water coming from the Hevron River that would be led by underground channels into these pools and then covered. Let's go down and see how it looked like. So friends, I hope you enjoyed the tour, the journey to one of the sites, one of the cities that our fathers dwelled in for years upon years. I'll see you again shortly. Until then, Shalom.